thanks again for being with us in this blog. We're hoping to improve our blogs and we want it to be clear that these blogs are not just uh, for Christians. In fact, we know today many who have the name Christian, it's just a cultural thing. They're not actually uh, specific followers of the Lord Jesus. That's why I often like to refer to myself as just a follower of Jesus and his teaching and uh, throw aside the name Christian, which is so confusing in some cultures. But we need to acknowledge the reality of different religions. And I've had the privilege of studying most of the world religions and believe we must respect one another's culture. We must learn from one another. I've read writings from Buddha. I've read, a, I lived in India and read a lot of Hindu material. Of course, I have a Quran. I've read that. And I think we need to listen to each other. I feel in my life that I always have two hats. It's just a way of explaining things. One is that I am a committed follower of Jesus and believe that being transformed by God's grace and by Jesus is the most important thing in life, including with it the free gift of salvation. But I have another hat is that I'm now a citizen of the UK, still have my USA citizenship, and that I have to live in a multicultural society. And I have to acknowledge that though in the past, governments have tried to enforce Christian principles on people, that this, this has become more complex. And I write about that in both of my books, um, Messiology, as well as Confessions of a Toxic Perfectionist. So I'm really hoping non-Christian friends and people of other religions will be at least willing to listen to me because a lot that I say, especially in this blog, uh, are relevant for all of us who live and share this planet with all of its difficulties. I'm praying that many of you will subscribe and just click like, which will help us move forward in improving our communication globally. I just heard on the news that um, the Extinction Rebellion people are actually blocking the M25. These passionate people have had major demonstrations and similar people in other parts of the world, in some cases causing a lot of damage, even sometimes bodily harm. But I, I feel for these people because I'm also a person of passion. And when I moved from New Jersey to segregated Tennessee, I was just passionate about this seeing justice and seeing change and had to search my heart and see if there was any subtle prejudice there against our dear black American people. Instead, from that time on, some of them became my closest friends, actually helped me uh, pioneer the work here in the UK. And next year we celebrate 60 years. I also became very passionate about the people in prison and jail and the, the conditions they faced. And so became very involved visiting jails, ended up uh, speaking in a prison. And then I went to Mexico, I was only 19. It was a bizarre, crazy thing, but it's because of our love for people. And I had a love for Mexican people before I ever met them studying Spanish. And in Monterey, Mexico, I had a life-changing experience in that I went to a rubbish tip, a garbage dump, and saw children uh, who were actually being fed food picked from the garbage. It was in Mexico where I first saw really raw poverty. And this has gripped me now, as you can see, a much older person all of my life, passionate about serving, about helping the poor. That's why I ended up living in India and Nepal. That's why I ended up launching a ship that would be major distributors of educational books. Yes, we have Bibles and Christian books, but often 80% of the books on display 
Many of you have visited our ships. The latest one is Lagos Hope. Uh, you know that they're largely educational books. I'm very privileged that from the age of about 12, I've studied history. And at Maryville College, I majored in history before going to Moody. And then uh, a summer or two later, I was able to study history at the University of Mexico. And it's been nonstop studying history. I've had the privilege of being in a hundred nations. And that's why I'm moving ahead with these blogs because I really want to share what I've learned from history, what I've learned from other people. Um, I've been very honest in my book, Confessions of a Toxic Perfectionist, about my own mistakes and my own sins. And so as I see these demonstrations, and there are more demonstrations as far as I can see, I watch the news quite widely, many different news channels, um, plus newspapers, been reading news magazines nonstop since I was 13. I, um, I feel for these people. Many of them are sincere, but I think many only have a small picture and they don't have the big picture. And we will never see these lofty goals of climate change uh, if we don't see internal climate change, if we don't see people change. When we think of the huge problems like crime, I was just doing a survey on the murder rate in Chicago. I think it's more than one a day. The murder rate in Mexico, the murder rate in many other countries. Do we think this is going to disappear because we get the the climate situation sorted out. The bigger problem is the toxic state of us human beings. And one of the greatest mistakes we're making is unwillingness to acknowledge there's something wrong with human beings. There's something broken that needs to be fixed. It cannot just be fixed by education, it cannot just be fixed by, uh, you know, watching blogs. It takes an internal transformation. This particular blog is a little more difficult for me because I got up thinking about all this in the middle of the night and uh, I wrote lots of notes. I'm not normally speaking from notes and so uh, I'm going to just launch out and just share a few of the things I wrote about what I call internal climate change. And the fact that if we see this transformation of human beings, I believe it is through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But I totally respect anyone that somehow in their own religion, in their own situation, have experienced transformation of life. And so that they uh, behave in a way that honors what maybe they're being taught because a lot of religions have some things in common, I believe, especially concerning love. And my last blog was all about love. And to me, even if you're a very loud, boisterous, Bible-believing Christian doing all kinds of things, if you don't have love, according to that passage, uh, you don't have anything. And so I hope you will find that spiritual revolution in your own lives. Let me just read these notes. Internal climate change. And what does it mean? It means going from selfishness to generosity. It means going from hatred to love. It means going from the love of pleasure to the love of service. It means moving from prejudice to justice and fairness. It means moving from laziness to discipline and hard work even willingness to suffer. It means moving from addiction to freedom. It means moving from extremism, so deadly, so many different forms, greatly on the increase because of fake news, because of misinformation. That is going to continue to be one of the most challenging, complex situations we face long, long past sorting out this great climate problem, which I don't think will get sorted out because of this very toxic factor in our human nature. 
unless we're willing for the kind of transformation that I'm sharing with you at this time. Let me just say again, moving from extremism to common sense, truth and balance, moving from ignorance to knowledge. People make these generalizations because some of them are very hurtful, and I know I'm guilty myself, is because they haven't often researched what's going on. And we get locked into the small picture and fail to see the big picture. I believe we need to realize that we're not battling one major global problem. And though some of the problems may get resolved as we improve in this whole climate challenge, other problems are going to be there. And I don't believe this planet, this overcrowded planet, with so much division, so much tension, and it does seem more and more various nations are becoming ungovernable. If you're really following what's going on and how very few people are really satisfied uh, with their government and with their leader. And of course, uh, a certain part of global culture wants to sort of force democracy on people. We're seeing the chaos concerning the Taliban right now. Wow, these are challenging days. It's not going to get any less challenging. And I believe the call for transformation, the call for internal climate change is greater than anything that I can think of. What are some of the things that we're going to continue to face and where we, we will not accomplish very much if we don't have this climate change I'm talking about? Corruption and injustice, it's huge. As I study this subject, I couldn't believe especially the money that leaders would, would move to Swiss banks. Uh, each one of these little points I'm going to touch on, I could write many pages, but I must move on. The whole problem of, of addiction. It's interesting that the first time I shared some of this recently in a public meeting, a small meeting, a woman came up to me after who had been totally addicted to drugs and alcohol a good part of her life. And then she experienced a transformation experience in with God and with the Lord Jesus. I don't think it was an accident that this took place just a few days ago. I was, as I was wrestling with how to share all this. How can we not be more concerned about everything connected with drug addiction and the whole world of drugs, the history of that and how people in very high places often uh, affirmed what was going on. I'm sure you follow the unbelievable murder rate in Mexico often linked with drugs. What can we say about sexual addiction, addiction and all the people that have been convicted lately, even very famous people of doing things wrong in this area. We think of the Rwanda crisis about 20 years ago or more now, still on the news again recently. And it just speaks of the awfulness of tribalism, which isn't just in Africa, but different forms of tribalism can exist even in places like the United States. We think of over 500,000 dead in Rwanda, maybe 200,000 women raped. How can we ever think that we can accomplish great things in this, in this world, on this planet, without transformation? Some people would use a stronger word, deliverance. And when we think of the tribalism in the last couple of years in southern Sudan, and in many other parts of the world, it just rips our hearts out. When we think of what uh, the people have suffered in India who are considered outcasts, sometimes they're called Dalits, uh, there's been many names, but the mistreatment of these people, the prejudice against these people is way beyond what I think we've known in our history in the States and the UK, but there's no need to make 
a comparison. The whole challenge of violence and murder, which I've already touched on, domestic violence, violence against women, the whole challenge of extremism, which is definitely going to increase because of the misuse of social media. We're seeing extremism in the political realm, extremism, yes, sad to say, often in the religious realm. And of course, even Islam is fractured now. It's always been fractured, but even more so with these very extremist groups who of course now have declared the Taliban as their enemy. When we think of the whole global health challenge and how some of these health issues like malaria and AIDS and other health issues um, are, continuing, are continuing. And this virus that we're in right now is continuing. Some people will think, well, all of this is too negative. And I know I have a tendency to be negative. So I've been reading this amazing book, Factfulness. It's really helped me because he points out how in so many areas there have been improvement. And I believe it points out it's because of transformed thinking. It's because people have been willing to admit they're wrong. One of the hardest things for us human beings to admit, admit we're wrong. And many of us who have read this book uh, have had to admit we were wrong in some of our thinking. It's not a Christian book. He has now died. And unfortunately, this book is pre-pandemic because this pan particular pandemic and there will probably be other pandemics in the future has changed the course of the world and the course of history. Yes, we are facing not just one challenge. We are facing so many challenges across the world. I've been doing a study recently about crime and the increase of cyber crime. Big news today about cyber crime in Ireland and what that is costing the government. Surely we can understand that globally, one of the biggest crises we face is connected with finance. It's connected with the, the fragile state often of finance in different countries. Can we not learn from Lebanon? Can we not learn from some of the other situations? I feel that people are often way too critical of big business people, way too critical of banks, and making these generalizations, especially throwing in this word equality, the equality movement, they're on the wrong planet. We need to live with reality. People in general will continue to be selfish and greedy. Most people will not embrace transformation. They will not be willing to admit their pride and confess their faults and sins or even turn themselves over to the police if they committed a crime. The more people who do that, the better. That is our passion. But we have to face the reality of history. It seems that only a minority of people will ever embrace these great challenges, only some of which I've shared with you. I hope you are among them. I hope you realize the complexity of the task. And I hope you will be radically committed to be a transformed person and to be a servant demonstrating that challenge of Jesus, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In my life, I was headed in the wrong direction. It only happened because Billy Graham pre preached the message of the new birth of transformation. And when I yielded my life in that Billy Graham meeting to Jesus, that transformation has begun and it has lasted pretty well every single day. You can ask hundreds and hundreds of people who know me and if many of them have lived with me and traveled with me and they will know this is not George Verwer's strength that has done this, George Verwer's cleverness. This is the transforming grace of a living, job, a living God and I hope you will embrace it with all your heart. But whether you do or don't, I hope somehow you can learn something from what I've attempted to share today. God bless you.